Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everybody. My name is Moises Rendon. I'm the director of the Future of Venezuela Initiative and Fellow of the Americas Program at CSIS. Today, we're discussing a timely and important event. We were planning to have this event in person in CSIS Washington headquarters, but for obvious reasons, now we're gonna use this, this means. Um, before we start, I wanna thank Freedom House, especially Alexandra Pina for his partnership during this project. In April, the Future of Venezuela Initiative in collaboration with Freedom House publish a policy brief about illegal mining in Southern Venezuela. You can find the brief in both English and Spanish on the same website page of this event. Of this event. I encourage you to check it out. The illegal mining in Southern Venezuela has huge implications and it should, have sh it should shape the way we both understand and respond to the Venezuelan crisis. We will be diving into these issues deeper today, but as a preview, I can give you three main overall issues that we'll be discussing. First, illegal mining is fueling human rights abuses, harming the environment, including the Amazon, posing a security threat for neighboring countries and the region, especially Colombia, the US most important ally in our region. Another important implication is that non-state armed groups, gangs, and the Venezuelan military are competing for control of precious minerals in the region. So in a way, Venezuela has become a battleground among criminal groups. And lastly, but not least, the illicit mining economy is propping up the Maduro regime and helping him to buy political loyalty among different actors. So the purpose of this event is to shed light on these issues and more, and to discuss the role of the international community to help halt illegal mining and restore peace in Southern Venezuela. For that, we have a, the honor to host an incredible panel with policymakers and thoughtful experts. We will be hearing from them before we open it up for questions. Please submit your questions that my team will be sending those to me. But before that, we, we have the honor to hear first from the Minister Carlos Olmes Trujillo. Uh, Carlos Olmes Trujillo is the Colombian Minister of Defense. He has, a, he has had a long career in public service, including as Minister of Interior, Minister of Education, and the High Commissioner for Peace. Minister Olmes Trujillo also served as a Colombian ambassador to several countries and to the UN and the OAS. The minister has a law degree from the University of Cauca with graduate students in criminal law and criminology. He also has a master's degree in, in international business from Sofia University in Tokyo. Ministro, es un honor tenerlo con nosotros. Thank you very much for taking the time and for joining, joining CSIS, the floor is yours. Moisés, muy buenos días. Saludos a Carrie Filippetti y a todos los panelistas en este importante encuentro. Gracias. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Today, the greatest real threat against Colombian democracy are the criminal structures with tentacles abroad, especially in our neighborhood dedicated to the business of illicit drugs and the illegal extraction of minerals. These criminal structures do not care about profiting from these illegal activities that destroy the environment or about whatever illegal business they can control. Criminals see no borders in their overflowing desire for dirty money. Both crimes, illicit drugs and the illicit extraction of, extraction of minerals are powerful factors of destruction. They generate poverty, destroy lives, and destroy our environment. Only the heads of those organizations reap benefits. And it is a temporary and ephemeral benefit, which in no way justifies the cost it entails. I have been saying this in various forums, at the risk that political sectors, enemies of the government of President Duque, will come out to say that this is a conspiracy against them, or against our neighbors, whom they defend. Illegal mining has been a strategic source of financing for illegal groups in Colombia for many years. Of course, this is not new, and we have been fighting them. The damage they have done is immense. The indiscriminate use of substances, such as cyanide or mercury, factually contaminates the water sources of our farmers. But they also enslave 
very vulnerable people and put them to work in the ranks and then they kill them. They affect local economy and institutions. And now we are facing the fact that many of the illegal structures that commit crimes in Colombia have found heaven in the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela to strengthen the criminal enterprises affecting us all greatly. As it is well known, in the face of the economic crisis and especially due to the losses of oil revenues, the Maduro government has used gold to finance international operations. According to intelligence information, 80% of the gold mine in Venezuela comes from the illegal exploitation of minerals. For years, the protection the Maduro regime has given the ELN has been known. Well, they then listen to this. In Catatumbo, Norte de Santander, the ELN would be entering gold illegally mined in the states of Bolivar, Apure, and Amazonas in Venezuela. And it relies on those resources to finance its violent actions in Colombia. In Guainia, the ELN and the Gao Residual Acacio Medina structure would be entering Venezuela in order to extract gold and black soil to strengthen their criminal economies. An important illegal mining activity in the Yapacana mines stands out. In Puerto Carreño, Vichada, an organization called Los Chatarreros has presence dedicated to the trafficking of minerals such as gold, diamonds, and black soil illegally stolen from the Orinoco mining arc in Venezuela to transport it to Colombia, Panama, Puerto Rico, and Spain. GAO residual members have regrouped in the Venezuela state of Amazonas and have resorted to the least exploitation of minerals to finance their expansion. The minerals illegally mined in Venezuela are transported by river on the Orinoco River to Puerto Carreño and later to the city of Bogotá. This reality forced us to reinforce controls at the border to find these criminal organizations we generate violence in our country and prevent them not only from continuing to destroy our resources and murdering our peasants and social leaders, but we also need to ignore the resources of finance. The issue here is that this matter becomes more complex if these criminal networks have the support, as it is known, of neighboring authorities and states. These facts generate new realities for us that Colombia must know and measure as a real threat against our democracy. As I mentioned, organizations engaging in illicit extraction, extraction of minerals not only destroy our country and kill our peasants and social leaders, but have spread its tentacles beyond our borders. In the different stages of this chain, drug trafficking organizations become part of it and in many cases manage to penetrate the financial systems. Illicit mining has also generated negative social impacts in the areas where it is undertaken, fostering threats to the security of citizens, displacement of foreigners to those regions, hence the presence of numerous Venezuelans, Brazilians, and Ecuadorians, and misshaping and generating illegal dynamics that affect the institutionality and local economy. From a transnational perspective, illicit extraction of minerals makes it hard to track their transactions. The weakness of national and international laws does not help to identify the origin of minerals and makes easy the use of these resources as a currency on drug trafficking and money laundering transactions. The illicit economy based on the illicit extraction of minerals and its subsequent money laundering has a complex route and network of actors such as illegal organizations, national and international authorities and companies. These criminal organizations make transactions with foreign clients, which on itself constitute a money laundering enterprise, since it derives from an illicit activity such as illegal mining. On this fraudulent operation, the drug trafficker sends cocaine to his criminal partner abroad, either in the United States, Mexico, United Kingdom, Spain, or, or others. Then, the illegal partner abroad makes a fraudulent gold import from Colombia or other countries such as Panama or Venezuela, to a paper company or a real company but associated with the drug trafficker. It is imperative that, at the international level, we succeed in agreeing on the need to broaden the spectrum of the fight against these criminal organizations. In this order of ideas, 
We need international cooperation to be successful against this phenomenon. Just to give an example, Switzerland reports that less gold has entered its country than Colombia reports has exported. And the United States reported that more gold entered Switzerland than what Colombia actually exported. This reveals the need to cooperate even further. It is necessary that the demand for gold at international level finds a way to certify to the buyer where the gold is coming from and that there is a system of responsibility in place for the demand similar to the Kimberley process with the so-called blood diamonds. Although between governments we are already working on some of these issues, from here I commend the international community to establish better instruments of cooperation against these criminal structures. That is why, for some time, Colombians have listened to me talking insistently about the necessary international cooperation on different fronts, something on which we are not going to let our guard down. Yes, we require more international cooperation because deep down, the dirty money of these criminals with the help of their tentacles abroad, strengthens their actions against our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ministro, for your great remarks. Um, now we're going to turn to our panel. Uh, so please le let me introduce them first. We're going we're gonna to hear from Carrie Filippetti first. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cuba and Venezuela in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the Department of State. She previously served as a senior policy advisor for the United, Na United States mission to the UN, where she advised UN Ambassador Nikki Haley on issues related to counterterrorism, the Middle East, and the Western Hemisphere. We're thrilled to have you, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining CSIS. The floor is yours now. Thank you so much, Moises. And, um, and it's, it's really an honor to be here with CSIS and with Freedom House. Uh, and we very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion. As you and I have sort of discussed um, together, this is something that I'm personally very passionate about. And, um, and the US government is undertaking a significant amount of efforts to try to, um, to improve our approach along the lines of what uh, Minister Holmes Trujillo mentioned. And I do wanna also say at the outset, um, it's wonderful to see uh, Minister Holmes Trujillo. It's been a very long time. Um, we've all been cooped up. I think the last time I saw you, sir, was um, was when you were uh, still foreign minister. So um, so it's it's great to see you in this capacity as well. I'm still working on these key issues. Um, so uh, really, Moises, as, as always, the policy brief that you and, and Claudia and Linnea wrote is actually a, a perfect starting point for this discussion and raises precisely the right questions. Um, I want to set the stage a little bit because the root of the questions posed in your brief um, is something that you've raised in the past, um, which is that as U.S. sanctions have done an effective job in um, restricting the Maduro regime's access to income from licit trade, um, the regime has increasingly turned to illicit sources of income, which includes, of course, narcotics, but also gold. Um, and so one of the ways that, that we focus on this program is in making sure that we are focusing on the broad range of issues raised by illicit gold mining. So that's not just the support that it provides to the Maduro regime, um, but gold mining really is the perfect storm of illicit income to the regime, human rights abuses, threats to Venezuela's internal security, promotion of transnational criminal and terrorist groups, as was just mentioned, and environmental devastation. So I wanna talk a little bit about those threats that we're seeing and then how the United States so far is posturing to respond. So we all know that since 2016, the Maduro regime has actively encouraged and facilitated the mining distribution and sale of gold in, in violation of both Venezuelan and international laws. And just as a quick side note, this really isn't just gold that we're talking about. That is the largest piece of this, but Venezuela holds vast deposits of diamonds, precious minerals, and resources like coltan, which um, we're probably all using right now as it's, as it's used in batteries, in electronics, cars, planes, things of that nature. Um, so in terms of the threats, I want to focus on kind of five key threats, and some of this um, Minister Holmes Trujillo uh, mentioned as well. First, the Venezuelan gold trade involves non-state armed groups, terrorist groups, and regional criminal organizations. 
they essentially are coordinating with the police and Venezuelan military and senior regime officials. This creates a vast network of criminality. It's partially why we don't refer to the Maduro regime as a government. We refer to it as a narco criminal state. Um, illicit mining provides an opportunity for illegal armed groups and violent criminal groups. And this includes the terrorist entities mentioned um, by, by the minister, like the ELN and the FARC, to cement their grip on power thanks to the profitability, permissive environment, and increasing government focus on mining as a substitute to um, oil profits. Uh, prison gangs known as Pranes, um, you know, the decentralized pro-government gangs we call colectivos, and ELN members and FARC dissidents are all active in the mining arc. And in many places, they retain power over mines themselves, over the transit routes, or over the resources required to successfully mine. Sometimes they essentially serve as these sort of pseudo-government entities, also providing medical care um, and access to food and water for those uh, indigenous communities that are living in the areas. So this leads to the second threat, which is governance. So illicit mining directly undermines US um, and international policy in Venezuela because it enables a patronage network that secures loyalty for the Maduro regime. I think it's really important that we understand that the money that the Maduro regime is making from the sale and distribution of illicit gold is not the number one threat. Really one of the number one threats is that this enables the regime to provide and trade um, control over certain territories and some money to ensure that they are buying this sort of patronage network and, and, and loyalty. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about how we've implemented sanctions to cut up sources of financial income and prevent the oil industry from being exploited for patronage in the past. Um, but since the regime both lacks the will and the capacity to stop people from exploiting mines, it's facilitating the access to mining revenue and in doing so reinforcing the loyalty of those allies, including terrorist entities. And so in this way, these gangs, the military and government officials are continuing to receive a largesse from the Maduro regime, which is a largesse that would have otherwise successfully been cut off by, um, by US and international sanctions. The third major threat um, is, uh, is that people physically mining the gold are being grossly exploited. Um, they're subject to horrific human rights abuses. Um, it's particularly true in Zulia, Bolivar, and Amazonas, which of course have the highest percentage of, of mining uh, because of the reserves of minerals, but they also have the highest percentage of populations of indigenous communities. So we've seen evidence of torture, forced disappearances, child labor, and of course murder and, and even wide scale massacres. Uh, that leads to the, the fourth threat, which is health. Um, we're not just here speaking of injuries, which are of course common, um, but when you look at how gold is um, extracted from the earth, a lot of it uses mercury. Um, tests performed in mining communities across Bolivar State, as, a, as an example, found that over 90% of people working in the mines showed unsafe concentrations of mercury in their urine, um, with effects also reaching 87% of women and 68% of children. We're also seeing trafficking in persons and sexual exploitations in these mining camps, creating spikes in HIV AIDS, as well as due to the stagnant water, exponential increases of diseases like malaria, diphtheria, yellow fever, and dengue fever. Um, that leads to, of course, the fifth issue, which is that this poisoned water harms not just humans, but it also harms the earth. So we're talking about ecological devastation, um, as does the immeasurable amount of drilling and deforestation that these processes require, which has wrought severe ecological damage to the Amazonian landscape. And so during the Q&As, I'm, I'm more than happy to get into some of the specifics on each of these five issues that are brought to bear by um, the Maduro regime's promotion of illicit mining. Um, but I wanna finish up my, my remarks just with a few thoughts on what the US is doing to try to confront this. Um, so it's clear that these problems touch on the interests and equities of a number of offices in the State Department, and in, in fact, many departments across the US interagency. Um, and so uh, this has sort of raised one of the one of the more difficult challenges within the U.S. government, which is intra-state and intra um, and interagency coordination. Um, when we seek to confront problems as complex and multifaceted as what we're seeing with illicit gold mining, uh, the biggest priority is making sure that we have established an internal coordination structure that can deliver a coherent interagency approach to the question. So. In order to do that, 
uh, my team and I conceived the idea of a gold working group with the specific purpose of spearheading a systematic U.S. government assault on the interests of those profiteering in any way from illegal gold mining in Venezuela and increasing efforts to protect those exploited by the gold mining process. Um, so we launched the working group in early March of this year. Um, and despite, of course, you know, working from home and the challenges presented by COVID-19, uh, we've already um, established coordination between um, a dozen different offices at Maine State, at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. and OAS, several of our embassies, as well as off offices from Treasury, Justice, Commerce, EPA, CBP, FBI, DEA, USAID, and Department of Labor. So this is really a, um, an interagency approach. So what is that being used to do? Well, first and foremost, we're focusing our diplomatic engagement on using all available multilateral and bilateral mechanisms to first inform the global diplomatic community and civil society partners of the Venezuelan gold crisis and then to mitigate the problem and its risks. And this is something that um, the minister um, raised as well, the importance of coordination between different countries. We're also working on strategic communications, which we're using to increase support among the U.S. and internationally based opinion leaders for halting Venezuela's illegal gold trade and to increase awareness of the threats of the illegal gold trade uh, to Venezuelan stability and regional and global security. I think most importantly, we are identifying mechanisms to put pressure on all relevant actors in the gold supply chain. So this includes using tools to investigate, um, identify, deter, and punish individuals, networks, and entities that are promoting this and profiting from illegal mining, from the distribution, from the sale, or the laundering of Venezuelan gold and its illicit proceeds. Um, we're also working with a comprehensive network of in-country and external experts, and I think many of um, of our panelists um, are, are, are critical voices in this as well, um, in order to uh, diminish the detrimental effects of illicit gold mining and focus on the human rights abuses, environmental degradation, corruption, and insecurity caused by these groups. Um, and then, of course, we are maintaining a strong focus on the humanitarian and environmental issues, as well as thinking about something that was raised um, very well in the brief, which was the day after needs. Uh, you know, right now we're seeing the proliferation of all of these armed groups taking control over certain small territories, sort of fragmenting Venezuela into these mini states run by narco terrorists and, and criminal gangs. Um, that's not going to go away if we get a negotiated transition with Maduro. They are still going to have weapons. They're still going to have control. They are still going to um, try to assert that control, um, even against a Venezuelan military that is now supporting a democratic government. So that is critically important. And I think something that I hope we'll focus on during the Q and A's. So this is all to say, and I know that's really just an overview, but it's all to say that this requires a wide range of tools. It also requires understanding that gold is not the same as, as diamonds. It's not the same as other resources. It's incredibly challenging to identify the source of the gold. And that's why we need to have this, um, this, uh, Multi, uh, multilateral efforts and coordination between multiple states to, uh, to ensure that we address that. So we're looking forward to, um, to continuing our work on this and coordinating with CSIS, Freedom House, the EU, Lima Group, and other international partners who are, who are willing to focus on this issue, because as I said, it really is the perfect storm. Um, and so once again, thank you so much for inviting me to participate, and I'm very interested in hearing the remarks of the other panelists and going to the Q&A. Wow, that was Great, thank you, Kerry. That was a great in overview um, between you and the minister. I think we covered most of the issues, and um, I, I hope we're gonna have time to to dive dive uh, deeper into into this because it's a complex range of issues that we need to cover. Uh, but for that, we have two great experts coming up. Um, first, we're gonna hear Alexandra Pina. She's a senior program manager for the Latin American and the Caribbean programs at Freedom House. Uh, in this capacity, she manages uh, programs on democratic governance, civic, civic engagement, and strengthening of human rights and fundamental freedoms in Latin America. She holds a PhD from the Italian Institute of Human Science. Uh, her published research focuses on democratization. Ale, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Moises, and thank you so much, CSIS. Uh, for this opportunity to talk uh, about uh, illegal mining that really became uh, uh, a very important topic, especially in the past couple of years uh, uh, after the economic collapse uh, in Venezuela. 
the sharp drop in oil production, hyperinflation, and the high levels of corruption made the gold becoming an important source of revenue for the regime of Nicolò Maduro. At the same time, state-owned gold extraction and production have been dismantled. That seems a little bit illogical. But between 70 and 90 percent of the mined gold leave Venezuela illegally. This means that it doesn't even touch the Central Bank of Venezuela. According to Ecoanalytica, the losses for gold smuggling between 1998 and 2016 were 3 billion US dollars. And then in 2018, only $2.71 billion. So this means in one year, the number is really comparable with the previous 18 years. Sorry, next. Um, so uh, in this uh, presentation, we are going to analyze the human rights consequences of illegal mining. Uh, and as Carrie highlighted, there are several consequences, but definitely, uh, is uh, heartbreaking to see the human rights violations against the population uh, that lives in the Orinoco mining belt and in the other states where there are illegal mining. But we cannot talk about human rights violations without uh, talking about power. So uh, the Orinoco mining belt has always been uh, traditionally under the controls of premise. So prison leaders, uh, that they were fighting each other to control a part of the territory. But since the last couple of years, especially, there is an increasing presence of the Colombian illegal groups, guerrilla, ELN, and FARC, but especially the ELN. And these two groups, nowadays we have so very violent fights among Pranis and then between Pranis and the ELN. And all of this happens under the complicity of the local authorities and local forces that basically um, are paid bribes to maintain silence. Silence during these fights and silence during the smuggling of the gold. There is no rule of law in Venezuela, but even less in the Bolivar state. So this means widespread impunity and the victims of human rights abuses that have no hope to have justice. Uh, Bolivar is a state where the, the uh, coin of the state Bolivar is not even accepted. Every transaction is done in gold, otherwise US dollars, euro or uh, petrol. This is to give you the idea that there is uh, they completely lack of any sort of rule of law. Next. So when we talk about human rights abuses, who are the victims? We have two different groups. The migrants that actually move from the other states of Venezuela to Bolivar, because this is the only state that can somehow ensure a salary or some sort of incomes for families. And then we have the group of people that instead are leaving the community uh, and go to other states because the level of violence is too high. Uh, so when we talk about victims, obviously we always think to the first victim of the abuses, but we also need to think about their families and their community. When uh, uh, we talk about violations, uh, the, the, we talk about severe abuses of human rights. That's what's happening in this uh, part of the country. Uh, we're talking about torture, forced disappearances, murder. And so these, uh, uh, these slides show you the traffic lights, how of punishment. So the first offense is punished with, by beating. The second infraction is punished with bodily mutilation, including the removal of limbs. The third with death by dismemberment. There is, there is completely no humanity in, uh, in the state of Bolivar, and this needs to be clear to all of us. Uh, unfortunately, these punished conditions set the scene for modern slavery, forced labor, and extortion. In the past couple of years, we assisted to over 40 massacres 
And what's happening is that every single community needs protection. And when protection is not guaranteed by local police, local forces, community are now seeking for protection with these armed groups. Because these armed groups, like Harry said, they are somehow defending the safety and security of, uh, of, of community, at least until uh, uh, they don't uh, get punished or they don't do infractions, and they also provide some sort, some sort of social services. So what is happening now is that even the indigenous community are basically seeking these, uh, uh, these uh, security with these groups, and in exchange, they are basically, um, they are basically offering their uh, labor to these groups. So if we look at the uh, uh, specific groups of, uh, um, of very vulnerable communities, uh, we cannot uh, not start with the children. 45% of the population of mine workers are, um, or are minors. And very often they don't go to school, instead they directly or indirectly work in the mines. If they are not directly involved in uh, uh, mining gold and other materials, they are uh, selling food. And very often they try to look for their protection going together in groups of kids. Uh, looking at women, very often they're forced into prostitution, sextortion, and sexual slavery. And those that are unwilling to submit, they face rape, torture, and death. According to the Bolivar State Police, only in 2018, there were over 3,500 women engaged in prostitution. In terms of the indigenous community, uh, they, um, they are uh, very much exposed to high doses of mercury, their waters is poisoned, and they are very often forced into slavery. So what's happening is that uh, uh, many members of these communities are trying to leave the Bolivar. Next. So in terms of some final conclusions, we see the devolution of the state power to regular groups. And that's very dangerous, but that's uh, what's going on in the past uh, at least four or five years, and especially in the past couple of years. There are massive economic interests and then an exponential growth of organized crime and pervasive use of violence. So this means that the Orinoco mining belt poses monumental threats that really go beyond the restoring democracy in Venezuela. Even if uh, uh, Maduro and his regime ends tomorrow, we still have some very open problems there to restore uh, rule of law and control of the territory. So uh, our recommendation is, first of all, to pay lots of attention to the documentation of human rights abuses. We have uh, coming up uh, the report of the UN Human Rights Council mid-July. We have the fact finding mission. The fact finding mission does not have at the moment the mandate to uh, investigate human rights violation connected with the legal mining. But September and October are coming up. And so what we are asking to the countries to please consider an extension of the mandate of the FAF funding mission. One more year, more resources, and please include illegal mining and violation against human rights as part of the mission of the, and the mandate of the FAF funding mission. Investigations. There are wonderful investigations conducted by lots of think tanks and NGO, Transparency Venezuela, Inside Crime, OCCRP, SOS Orinoco, Armando Info. These are just some of them. Please, uh, uh, we ask to uh, international, uh, uh, international institutions, uh, um, governments, uh, foundation to continue funding these uh, important actors and also please give publicity to the work, the serious work that they produce. At the moment there are 78 open corruption cases pertaining to Venezuela in 20 countries that are democracies. These 
when we talk about corruption, we know that very often there are connections with the illegal mining. We hope that these 20 countries and others can create some sort of accountability since in Venezuela there is no hope to have so. Protection for whistleblowers. We already saw that the environment is terrible in this, uh, uh, in this territory. So even, uh, uh, so even more uh, protection needs to be guaranteed to whistleblowers. Last but not least, assistance to indigenous community. Then at the moment it's very hard even for organizations that usually are in touch with this community to get in touch with them. There is a loss of uh, uh, communication between whoever, all the part of indigenous that had to flee and are now in Brazil and the, the ones that are still in Venezuela. So every, every assistance on communication is very much welcome as well as uh, PP equipment and humanitarian assistance. Thank you so much, Alessandra. That was super thoughtful. Uh, I'm sure we're going to go back to some of these issues. Um, I, I see that they're very important. Cri Cristina, now we're going to hear from you. J Cristina Burelli is the founder and executive director of V5 Initiative, a nonprofit that advises and connects civil society organizations in the Americas that focus on universal values, democracy, and the environment. Cristina is an international liaison at SOS Orinoco, CSO Orinoco, an organization that currently operates undercover in Venezuela to shed light on the illegal mining situation in the Amazonas and Orinoco region. She's a senior associate at CSAS as well. Thank you so much, Christina, for joining today. The floor is yours. Uh, make sure to unmute yourself. Um, yeah. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Moises. So why should the international community care about yet another crisis in Venezuela? And, you know, for many in the international community and indeed the global environmental community, who, by the way, has been very silent on the uh, environmental crisis in Venezuela thus far, um, it's probably surprising to learn that Venezuela is one of the top 10 mega biodiverse countries in the world alongside Brazil. Venezuela and Amazonia comprises not only the, the lion's share of the Guyana Shield, and this is a, a Precambrian geological formation. It's one of the oldest parts of the world, well known for its tabletop mountains called Tepuis. And this is what makes Venezuela unique among the rest of the more well-known, larger Amazonian countries. So as we have heard, once the oil sector was destroyed, Mining for gold, coltan, rare earths, diamonds in southern Venezuela has really become the sole source of revenue for the Maduro regime. And complete disregard of the extremely delicate environment and social concerns is damaging the social structure of indigenous communities. It's propelling a health crisis, accelerating human rights as we just, uh, violations as we just heard from Alessandra fueling all sorts of associated illicit activities, violence, and basically undermining national security and sovereignty. Next slide. Next slide, please. The Orinoco mining arc, Maduro's signature mining gamble, is a rubric for a policy that gives the outward appearance of having a well-delimited geographical scope. And so you can see the bright red part of this map is the Orinoco mining arc, which is the size of Portugal. Um, but the sad truth is that this has sparked a, a, and promoted a chaotic gold rush that is spreading out into areas south of that that go well beyond the illegally decreed uh, Orinoco mining arc. It's now evident that the Maduro regime's objective is to convert the entire southern region of Venezuela, which is about 60% of the national territory that lies below the, it's, 60% of the national territory lies below the Orinoco, as you can see on the map. Um, and, and they want to convert into a mining free-for-all, the control of which is increasingly being outsourced by the regime to local criminal gangs, Colombia's guerrilla groups, ELN and FARC dissidents, and the private armies of all these foreign countries, uh, the companies that are receiving illegal concessions in the, in the ARC. 
Obviously, this is a very complex problem. We could talk for hours. I could show you tons of photos and satellite images, but I only have five minutes. So I'm just going to concentrate on a few critical areas that illustrate the extreme, um, the extremes of this, of this situation. Next slide, please. So this gold rush today includes Ganaima, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, home to Angel Falls, which is the highest waterfall in the world. Um, in 2018, SOS Orinoco identified 33 illegal mining sites in and on the edges of Ganaima. Last week, SOS Orinoco published this new map with 26 additional mines. Um, so that means that in two years, uh, the, the, the size and, and, and the, the amount of mines that are identified has pretty much doubled. Um, in all of southern Venezuela, SOS Orinoco has identified 646 mining sectors within which there are hundreds of individual mines. As a result, we can say that Venezuela is the Amazonian country with the highest number of illegal mines and the highest rate of deforestation. And by the way, none of the uh, environmental, big environmental organizations are highlighting this or saying anything about this. They're, they're all concentrating on Brazil, but they don't say anything about Venezuela. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a photo of the Caroni River, which is the Western border of Canaima National Park. It propels 70% of Venezuela's hydroelectric power, and 70% of this river may be at risk of contamination resulting from sediments and the use of mercury in the illegal gold mining operations. So just think about that. Next slide, please. This is Yapacana National Park. So the second area, this is the second area I'd like to draw your attention to. And it's in the pristine state of Amazonas, close to the Colombian border. This has become a FARC fiefdom, where dissident FARC lord over this national park and control all the illegal gold mines. If you look closely at the bottom right satellite image, you will see small speckles, sort of white areas on top of the debris. Those are mines. And I just want to point out that every gram of gold illegally produced enriches the coffers of the Colombian guerrilla, as the minister uh, pointed out. Um, and and the, the Colombian guerrilla are being granted safe passage and haven by the Maduro regime. So as long as the FARC have this unfettered access to Yapacana, Colombia and the broader region will be under growing threat of their terrorist activities. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this is the, the other area that I wanted to highlight, um, the Upper Orinoco Caciquiare. And uh, the expansion of illegal mines in this area are controlled by the FARC dissident. And they're not only threatening the existence of the Yanomami indigenous people, but they're also a threat to the whole neighborhood because the FARC are demonstrably in alliance with the invading Brazilian miners or Garibeiros. And uh, you may well ask how. Logistically, this all happens. Well, the Venezuelan armed forces also take their cut by providing logistical and air support with helicopters that transport fuel, machinery, et cetera, into the mines, some of which are on top of the tepuis, like in the case of Yapacana. Next slide. So Russia, China, Iran, and others, including non-state, transnational criminal groups and rapacious Middle Eastern buyers of gold have identified the opportunities arising from Maduro's weakness and disregard for the rule of law. And they're basically prolonging Maduro's political, uh, the, prolonging Venezuela's political agony. The mining sector has turned into a very intricate, organized and disorganized crime melting pot that has utterly corrupted the senior levels of the regime's nomenclature. So these high officials and military officers are being rewarded and loyalties guaranteed by Nicolas Maduro, who solidifies his hold on power by indiscriminately parceling out access to this vast wealth. Reportedly, as has been mentioned, 80% of gold produced in Venezuela 
And it's estimated, nobody really knows, but it's estimated to be at 70 tons per year is being smuggled out. Colombia being one of the main destinations where it enters with no or little apparent uh, impediment into their own gold supply chain. And this is a problem that Colombia needs to address urgently, particularly now that it officially became a member of the OECD. And as we know, the OECD has very strict guidelines on mineral supply chains. Next slide. So in conclusion, I, my, my, the, the main message here is that we're in a race against time and criminals to stop this unprecedented devastation in Venezuela, Venezuelan Amazonian forests and the explosion of mineral conflicts that will impact neighboring countries and the hemisphere. The threat posed to the security and stability of neighboring countries, Colombia, Brazil, Guyana, the Caribbean islands, uh, by a spiraling conflict for access and control of Venezuela's mineral wealth should not be underestimated. The international community must not allow the fight for mineral wealth that has decimated several African countries to take hold in the middle of the Western Hemisphere. A failed state festering in this same time zone as Washington, D.C., blessed with desirable natural resources and lacking any semblance of a responsible and accountable government is certain prey for many and a legitimate concern for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. And thank you all for your very thoughtful presentations and introductions. Minister, I know you have to go. We appreciate very much uh, your time. And, and, and again, we're honored to have you at CSIS. Uh, would you like to say something before you go? But thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity and let's keep in touch. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thanks a lot. Ciao, Carlo. Gracias. Thank you very Gracias, much. Gracias. Gracias. Great. Um, so thank you all. I think this is a great start for this event. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to have time for Q&A from the audience. But before we get there, I want to... I want to put a couple of questions for, for, for Kerry, Alexandra, and Christina no? to get a little bit deeper into these issues. Um, Kerry, you, you mentioned that, you, you know, you, you mentioned there are five different angles on how to look at this crisis, uh, this, this, the different layers and different implications to each of them. Um, but more generally, the, the goal, as, as you know, is, is also beyond Venezuela. It's going towards so many other countries in the war as, as the presenters mentioned, the, uh, the, the, there's a presence of countries like Iran, China, Russia, and others in, in the region. Um, so I wonder if you can maybe explain a little bit how the goal, where's the goal going? What, what are the main countries that are benefiting from it? Um, and, and, you know, a little bit on, on, on what is the U.S. and, and more broadly the international community doing on to try to disrupt this this gold smuggling routes and and i think that that will be an interesting issue that we, we can maybe get deeper but back to you gary no that's a that's great that you asked that you're sort of reading my mind because as christina was speaking um i was actually writing down there's actually a sixth and the sixth threat is um is external state actors um and it's not just external state actors when it comes to the recipients of gold, those who are purchasing the gold, but there are also external state actors that are involved in the actual mining and extraction of the gold. So, you know, Christina mentioned uh, China, Russia, Iran, we're also seeing Turkey um, has uh, historically set up some arrangements in the mining of, of gold. Um, and so in terms of kind of the, again, this goes back to how the U.S. views this not just as the sale of gold, but the full supply chain. So you look at, you know, China, for example, um, in 2016, China, uh, a Chinese company, CAMC Engineering Company, was one of the first international companies that was invited to enter the mining arc. Um, and then uh, we've seen uh, agreements between the Venezuelans and Russia um, on the mining of gold, diamonds, and coltan. And, and again, China is also very interested in coltan, which I mentioned is very heavily used in the production of, of electronics and is, and in fact, a, a, a resource that has um, has promoted insecurity and violence uh, throughout the world uh, in, in the past as well. Um, 
Iran, we're also seeing get involved in Venezuelan mining. Um, we see them in Tatra. There is a concern that they're involved in um, activities which may be mining elements like uh, uranium and other equipment and other uh, resources that could be used um, for nefarious purposes. Um, and then if you want to talk about those who are uh, receiving gold, you're looking primarily at Turkey. Iran, of course, recently received a shipment of gold, we suspect, uh, in exchange for the gasoline that they supplied. Um, in the past, you had also seen countries like the UAE being involved in this. We've seen a little bit less of, of, of their involvement. Um, but I would say that the, the key recipients are still Turkey and Iran. And um, when it comes to uh, those who are involved in the supply chain, you know, the actual extraction, we're seeing China, Russia, and Iran uh, most most dominantly. But I would also ask, you know, Christina the same thing, because she she may be seeing other ways in which they're involved in the um, in the extraction on the ground in Venezuela. Great, thank you. Anything to add, Christina? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of rumors about, you know, the Chinese and the Russians and, and everybody, but uh, these these foreign countries being involved in in el arco minero and and uh, particularly in arco minero because there was a big licitation there was a lot of publicity but frankly it's very difficult to find any evidence of uh, these companies being present on the ground what seems to have happened is that when the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians and all these foreign countries even Canadians arrived on the scene and, and, and have seen the, the, the chaos and the, the criminality and the fact that all these big mines are in the hands of Franes and, and, and um, sindicatos and so forth. They're like, there is no way we're gonna send our employees and our you know, company, however you know, um, distasteful those companies may be, but you know, they, there is a sense of responsibility. They're not gonna send their people there. And, and, and one of the theories uh, that, that's going around, and this is based on you know, testimonies from people who are on the ground in El Callao and all that, that one of the reasons that the ELN has come in with such force in Bolivar is that the Maduro regime has tried to outsource the, the, the cleaning up of these mines to the ELN um, so that they have the blood on their hands and, and, and try to be able to hand over these big mines to foreign companies. But so far they haven't been able to do that. So there's, there's very little evidence of the companies actually operating and of these countries operating on the ground. Yes, thank you, Christina. Um, Alexander, I wanna to turn to you now. Uh, you know, one of the main issues that we have covered and all, all the speakers have done is to say that this is this is a this is a last lasting issue. It's gonna go beyond any any future government in Venezuela, right? This is not gonna this is gonna not not gonna get um, any time normalized if we see a future government, a democratic government. So um, can you walk us through a little bit what policies will will a day after government in Venezuela will need to implement, maybe from a human rights situation as you're focusing, to minimize the, the suffering of local communities and, and make sure to establish lasting peace in this very volatile region of Venezuela? Well, in general terms of Venezuela, we have all uh, this challenge, right? In the sense that we want the end of this regime and then we want to get ready for democratization. So it's kind of like that all of us, both in terms of institutions and governments and uh, civil society organizations and NGO, like in my case, we work on a binary uh, strategy. And I think that we need to strongly continue uh, working in these like two tracks. Uh, and uh, in terms of human rights, I would say that documentation on one hand, but then so what do we do with all these documented cases? So uh, in terms uh, of Venezuela, we really need to start, and we have been doing, uh, working on transitional justice, for example. Because, uh, uh, and, because at some point when the, the justice, uh, well, democratization will happen, we need to provide justice. And uh, we know that we need to prepare the territory, and Colombia is actually uh, a, a good example uh, to explain uh, 
uh, how difficult transitional justice is. Uh, obviously, this is more uh, um, something that pertains to all human rights violations, not necessarily only uh, in terms of illegal mining and uh, human rights violation connected. But uh, talking more specifically on illegal mining, we also need to prepare uh, what's, the, the, what's happening the day after. Because on one hand, we need to recuperate the control of the territory. But on the other hand, there will be some openings. And the, the, the economic interests are still there. So we need to work in partnership with uh, uh, institutions, uh, both internal to Venezuela, the democratic forces, but also the international level, and create some guidance to not pass from this situation to another situation where they will be taking advantage. Like human rights needs to be always part of the picture. We cannot just uh, be based on economic interest but environmental consequence and human rights need to, to guide these, uh, um, these uh, discussions and always with the participatory presence of a local community, especially indigenous communities. Thank, thank you, Alep. Great. Kerry, I want to turn to you. I, I have another question that uh, I think it will be helpful for our audience to hear from you. And is the role of sanctions in, in Venezuela. We, we hosted you before on this issue as well. And, and you know, as we continue to, to, to stand sanctions in, in an individual and sectorial basis in Venezuela, uh, there is a rising question or concern whether sanctions are the right tool, right, to, to try to limit the, the, the Maduro regime still in the money and, and the resources of the Venezuelan people. Um, uh, in this context of illegal mining, um, I, the U.S. has sanctioned uh, the, the mining sector in a way, right? One of them is, is this state-owned company called Minerven. The U.S. Treasury Department has imposed sanctions on Minerven and others. And, and in a way, it has monitoring, right? Every time there is a company related to the mining sector, it shows those red flags, right, that, that, that I'm sure the Treasury is looking very closely. But overall, uh, where, and I, you mentioned it earlier, but let's get a little bit deeper on, on where do you see sanctions, whether where it's the right tool to disrupt gold smuggling and gold illegal gold mining in Venezuela, or do you see other type of tools that may be more effective in that sense? Sure, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and ultimately it does go back to one of the first points about how Sanctions are an incredibly valuable tool in order to limit what would otherwise be described as, you know, a sort of formal economy, right? Um, and so unfortunately, illegal mining is, of course, not a part of the formal economy. And so there is a role of sanctions. I would say it's one of a number of tools that we can be using. So in terms of how we can use sanctions, and here I just want to clarify, I'm speaking in a theoretical sense, I'm not necessarily previewing any specific actions that we're going to be taking. But, you know, ultimately, looking at not just sanctioning Venezuelan companies, but that are involved in illicit mining, but also in sanctioning those companies, foreign companies that are involved in um, either selling equipment or materials that are used in the extraction of gold. So whether that's mercury, whether that's mining equipment, um, you know, there is, uh, because we've designated the entire gold sector, uh, you know, we talk a lot about licit and illicit gold, um, which is actually different from legal and illegal gold. And so in the Venezuelan context, because of our sanctions, the U.S. perspective is all of it is illegal, which makes it a lot easier for us to target those entities that are selling supplies that um, that are involved in the extraction of gold because they shouldn't be doing that in any case. So there is a role for sanctions. Um, I do think, though, you know, some of the things that we're most concerned about when it comes to the gold industry in Venezuela is not, as I mentioned, the specific money that's going to the Maduro regime. It is the empowerment of the FARC and the ELN, and it's the human rights abuses. Those are kind of, if I had to prioritize, you know, what we're focused on. And so that also allows us to use a number of other tools, especially when we get insights from these organizations that Alessandra mentioned, you know, SOS Orinoco and Insight Crime and, um, and, and, and all of the others is, 
we can then use that kind of public source information to focus on designating specific individuals with sanctions, um, if there are severe um, abuses that ultimately uh, are involved in corruption, we can also look at using our Department of Justice tools, our DEA tools, our FBI tools. Um, so I would say that, again, this is why it needs to be an interagency effort um, and a multilateral effort, because sanctions are important, but they're not the, the be all end all. The only other thing that I would add is that um, it's also incredibly important that we recognize that even though the departure of Maduro does not necessarily solve the security issues that we're seeing, um, it is useful in that ultimately our end game is to make sure that Maduro is out because if he is out, then that can help us with addressing some of the security threats and others that, um, that come to the fore even after his departure. Thank you, Carrie. That was great. Christina, let's go back to you. Um, I also have a question for you. Um, okay. I just wanted to make a comment on on what Carrie Go ahead. Said. Go ahead. On the sanctions. That's my question. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, that, that there is a theory that uh, sanctioning uh, gold production, and, you know, illegal gold production will further force the Venezuelan gold production into, uh, you know, to, to be smuggled. So it's sort of the balloon effect. If you, if you sanction gold, then it, it, it has no other way but to be smuggled out through Colombia, basically in Guyana and, and, and uh, you know, uh, the ABC islands. And so, you know, there are people out there who, who say that sanctions may not be the most effective way of um, combating illegal gold or that it has to be combined with other things such as enforcing OECD guidelines. And the OECD, as I mentioned, they have really strict guidelines on you know, the origin of gold, kind of like the Kimberley process that uh, the, the Minister Trujillo mentioned. Um, and, and so I think it's very, I mean, obviously OECD, it's, it's European. Um, I, think, I think it has to be sort of a two-pronged approach to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let's and, and sorry, and then there's the, go, go ahead. And, and there's another thing is it's 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 the the we we also need to look at mercury and where the mercury is coming from, and yeah. and we know that you know the traffic that mercury is being trafficked from Mexico through Colombia into Venezuela. That 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 seems to be the part, and yeah. and so I think the U.S. also needs to focus on you know the the, the smuggling of you know mercury. I, I have a question from our audience. And again, I will encourage our audience to, to start sending your questions. And, and it's exactly on this point of the OECD, Christina, that you have made, right? And it says, um, do you, uh, OECD due diligence principles, how exactly can companies in the US, Europe, and Asia increase due diligence to minimize the extent to which Venezuelan blood gold enters global markets? Um, do you have any insights on that regard, Christina? Okay, so the difficulty with gold, as has been pointed out, is that unlike diamonds or even coltang, I mean, coltang you can trace back because it, it's got radioactive, uh, it's radioactive, you can trace it back to the, the, the place where it was originally mined. In the case of gold, it's very difficult. You know, once it enters a, a, a supply chain, you cannot trace it back to any specific mine or, or region. And, and I think that is the challenge with Colombia is that because it's coming in uh, via the rivers and, and, and so forth, once it enters Colombia, it's untraceable. We know it's coming in because Colombia is exporting much more than it produces. Um, so I think now that Colombia is officially a member of the OECD, the, the, the key would be for Colombia to start implementing these OECD guidelines, and that would help. Um, and, and obviously the international community and the US should, and, and Europe um, need to help Colombia in this. I mean, it's a very, very difficult um, problem to tackle. I, I don't think they can do it on their own. Um, and, and they need all the support and all the help. And, and, but implementing these OECD guidelines will eventually help 
Yeah. Uh, I think we're losing your connection, Christina. Um, well, thank you. I, I think we got most of it. Uh, Ale, let's turn to you. Um, you know, we, we are on this uh, conversation of what is the role of the U.S. international community to help, right? I mean, we, we now know the problem. It's a huge problem. Um, but then we're trying to figure out what, what are the tools out there that we can implement. And we have covered a lot of them. Um, but you have mentioned that indigenous communities, women, children are probably the most affected communities um, um, in this crisis, right? And, and it's not, you know, I, I, it's, it's, we, we see this same playing out with the humanitarian crisis more broadly in Venezuela. Women and children are, are always uniquely affected by, by it. Um, but in the context of uh, blood gold, uh, blood gold um, what do you think? Uh, and you cover some of that, but let's get deeper a little bit. What, what can the international community, naming the European Union, the US, Latin America, and other countries that want to help, uh, for example, through multilateral institutions or organizations, can do to improve right now human rights conditions in Venezuela, especially in southern Venezuela? Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I think that the first step is disseminate information. Uh, at this point, we have public reports, but I don't know how much uh, uh, is known uh, much beyond like our communities. Sometimes uh, we feel that uh, because uh, is, uh, we read all these reports that everyone knows. Uh, however, I know that, for example, the European Union uh, pays a lot of attention to uh, women and, uh, and children. So I think that uh, we need to do some uh, efforts there, uh, more public events, uh, more resolutions. There are, uh, there are tools both uh, at the parliament and with uh, uh, the, um, the international service, um, the EAS, that can be used uh, to give more visibility. Also, uh, our effort is uh, to get more in touch with civil society in, the, in Europe, because a little bit, sometimes I know that uh, uh, Latin America in general is remote for Europe, but uh, we should not forget uh, what, what's going on. These times are very challenging because Europe has been hit a lot uh, by COVID, and I know that uh, lots of uh, the attention is uh, focused now on internal problems. However, I think that is uh, um, still very important to not forget uh, what's happening in Venezuela and to have that uh, on, uh, on the agenda. So uh, dissemination of information is the first point. The second is assistance. Uh, there are uh, uh, programs uh, and uh, forms uh, to assist these, uh, uh, these communities, both directly and, and, and through civil society organizations. There are uh, excellent small groups uh, in the Bolivar, very active, uh, that possibly with more resources, not just financial, sometimes also in terms of capacity, sometimes it's in terms of tool. Like I said, uh, communication is uh, a very uh, it's a huge problem because if we cannot communicate with people uh, in, uh, in, in, in this village, it's impossible to coordinate and it's impossible also to coordinate responses when there are urgent threats or attacks. So I think that these are very concrete uh, uh, initiatives that uh, we can all take. And obviously, like organization like Freedom House is very active on this, but we need more support. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, I, I'm getting, again, questions. I'm trying to read them through. Um, I, I have one here for you, um, Carrie. Uh, uh, this is coming from Mia Dahl. He's a Harvard Kennedy School student. Um, and he's asking, um, who do you see as the key actors and organizations that must be mobilized in order to combat the ongoing ecocide of human rights abuses in the mining art? I think it's connected to what Alexandra was just telling us, right? That the, the international community should be more engaged for more specifically. What are the key actors, Carrie, that you see that needs to be taking the lead, the, the, the leadership and, and kind of change the, the narrative and, and, and be more involved on, on the illegal mining in Venezuela? 
Well, I think, um, you know, as, as Alessandra said, I think this kind of starts with just the, the raising of awareness, right? Uh, a lot of folks are interested in the political crisis that's happening in Venezuela, in the humanitarian crisis that's happening in Venezuela. But because the regime is not authorizing most human rights groups to be on the ground, we're not getting the same kind of granularity of detail on what exactly is going on within the within the mining region and particularly because of the lack of security and safety there you know we really do rely on individuals who are compromising their own personal safety in order to report back to us we don't have the same kinds of structures that we see in other countries with human rights violations where the UN has a stronger presence um, or, or other NGOs have a stronger presence i mean any human rights NGO that's on the ground in Venezuela much like the humanitarian ones are really taking their their lives um, into their own hands, and so that's very um, that's something that is important to note because even with that limitation, we're still seeing how there's um, you know I think the statistic was mentioned forty massacres um, in the mining arc, um, and uh, and seeing you know we've we've gotten uh, it, these horrible images of of people whose um, you know hands were cut off, whose um, you know there's this. Uh, uh, one example that 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 is really horrific, which was a former member of the Venezuelan military who um, had to go to Bolivar uh, to a, a mine for work. Um, and when they discovered that he used to be a part of the Venezuelan armed services, uh, he was 19. He was tortured. They cut out his tongue. They made him swallow it. Um, they amputated his hands. They gouged out his eyes. I mean, this is this is on a, a complete different level than what we're used to um, the what we're used to dealing with and and and, and this happens with some regularity in, in in the mining arc so I say that both to to shock people into action and to to really recognize that um, this is something that needs more attention I think this kind of event I think events that you know uh, programming and information that's raised by other nonprofit organizations is is especially important. Um, and, you know, Christina mentioned that we're not seeing a lot of activity from environmental organizations, which I fully agree with. Um, this is, you know, the ecological devastation in this region. You know, you're talking about an area that has, you know, I, I think something like um, 9,000 flora um, in, in the mining arc, which is all being compromised by, by these actions. So drawing attention to these issues is so important. That's where civil society, NGOs, and others can be involved. In terms of sort of more formal action, you know, the UN needs to do more. Uh, that, that goes without saying, you know, there's, there's a tendency on the part of the international community to prioritize access over impact. Well, as long as we're allowed to be here, even though we're not allowed to report on anything, even though we're not allowed to do anything is better. Well, it's really not, right? Because you're there for a reason. The access is there for a reason. And so um, we do need to insist on organizations, whether it's the UN Human Rights Council, whether it's um, you know High Representative Bachelet herself, to actually focus on this and not just say, okay, we need to do more, we need to do more but actually come up with ideas for how we can do more, penalize people for, for engaging in these activities. This, this sort of default to just statements being enough, um, it's not enough, not when you're dealing with individuals who are, who are abused in, in the manner that we're seeing in the mining arc. I, I fully agree with you, Kerry. Uh, I, I know, Ali, you wanna, but Christina, why do you think you haven't seen more movement or, or environmental organizations doing more in Venezuela? How can we change that, that right away? Yeah, you know, I think um, Venezuela, as I started off, you know, very few people know that Venezuela, you know, is such an important Amazonian country from a, a qualitative point of view, not size. And, and, and you know, Venezuela, you know, Venezuelans are, are in part um, responsible for that because for so many decades, we were focused on oil production. We were looking north. We were never looking south. And, and even Venezuelans were very ignorant about, you know, the, 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 the treasure that we have south of the Orinoco. Um, very little tourism that was never exploited. No, no, pretty much no exploitation of the minerals. It was all very artisanal. And, and so I think 
the large environmental uh, NGOs haven't really been focused on Venezuela at all. Um, and I think now it's time to turn their attention to that because I think we've just taken it for granted. Everybody has taken it for granted. Um, but I just wanted to go back to um, a point that Carrie uh, mentioned about the UN and the UN getting more involved. I know they're getting more involved. Um, we've had conversations with um, groups, whatever, but I think there's one group in particular um, at UN Environment, um, and this takes me back to my point about the fact that we have to do our utmost to stop Venezuela from becoming more like an African country. I mean, we've never seen this. I mean, Latin America has always had mining um, since you know pre-Columbian times, but and all kinds of human rights abuses. You know, uh, the Incas, the Spaniards, the conquistadores. I mean, they, they, we don't have a clean record, but we've never had the mineral conflicts um, that have been seen in Africa. And in that vein, the UN uh, Environment Program developed the Expert Advisory Group on Environmental Conflict and Peace Building. And this is a very technical group at UN Environment. And it was developed in 2008 in order to solve problems in Africa, you know, with the Coltan Wars or whatever. And I, I think it's time for them to start getting involved in Venezuela and the neighborhood. And, and we really need to reach out to them and, and, and try to get, you know, their expertise. Absolutely. Thank you, Christina. Ali, you wanted to mention something. Sorry. Yes, just in connection with this topic of the UN that uh, um, Carrie mentioned, I think that is very important. And I obviously t follow my, more the human rights uh, uh, part. Uh, I think it's very important that we pay lots of attention to this report uh, of the Bachelet. And uh, uh, it's essential that organizations uh, still send all the materials, all the reports to all bodies uh, uh, in Geneva. But it's also important that countries uh, arrive prepared to September and October. As I mentioned, the fat finding mission, that, that can be key for, uh, uh, for Venezuela. And Venezuela, unfortunately, is one of the members of the Human Rights Council. So this means that uh, they should uh, uh, comply with, uh, uh, with all the rules of human rights at the UN level, and that they should cooperate with the uh, ins UN institutions. So I, I hope that uh, this work of uh, checking uh, these aspects is not just left to uh, the hands of NGO. I hope that countries that are part of the um, Human Rights Council can also monitor uh, the behavior of the uh, behavior of, what, of of the main actors and stakeholders that are in Venezuela. Thank you. Okay, uh, we we're almost there, running out of time. Um, I, I do want to you know maybe finish with. With, with a question, I want to also leave it open to, to you, Carrie, um, and, and the other two speakers to, to provide any last remarks you would like. Uh, but, you know, I, my, my question is for the three of you. And, and it's more about, like, yes, we're talking about the UN and other countries. The US is probably the most important ally here. Uh, but there, there are other countries, like Colombia, we, for example, we hear from them directly today. Well, Brazil, Guyana, the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands are also part of this equation. And so where do you see the role of these countries, uh, neighboring countries, to both help hold, contain the gold smuggling from Venezuela to, to not get to the global market? And, and what, should be, what, what should they be doing about it? Um, um, again, it's open for all of you and any final remarks you would like to put on the table. Um, I'll, I'll then jump in, uh, Moises. So, you know, I think the neighboring countries of Venezuela, you know, when you think about the, the victims of the Maduro regime, we're often looking at, you know, the, the people of Venezuela, uh, individuals who have seen their human rights taken away from them, um, individuals who are being harassed and intimidated by the Maduro regime. 
Um, but really, Venezuela's neighbors are also victims of the Maduro regime, uh, not just in the need to um, accommodate and, and absorb, you know, over five million refugees, um, but also in, in the fact that, you know, they are seeing um, exploitation, and human trafficking and sex trafficking and gold smuggling across their borders on a regular basis. So I think one of the biggest things we can do is, number one, make sure that the um, the local governments in the border states and border towns are aware of this problem because we have seen some very concerning activity along some borders uh, where we know, you know, the, the, the foreign ministries of, of these governments are not in any way trying to profit from the gold trade. But we are seeing how individual towns, which are seeing an influx of Venezuelan migrants need more and more money, actually get involved somewhat in, in, in this illicit gold trade in order to promote their own local economy. So that's that's number one. We need to make sure that there is um, security, that there is um, assistance provided to these areas so that they're not compelled to be involved in this kind of activity. Um, the second thing is to make sure that they continue to receive assistance from countries like the United States and the European Union in order to provide um, support and, and, and security to them as they deal with these issues. So I think there's, there's both what those countries should be doing themselves and then also how the international community needs to be a partner to them to ensure that they have the resources to do everything they can to prevent this illicit gold from coming into their borders. Thank you, Gary. Christina, Ale, any final remarks? Yes. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, for the for the neighboring countries, um, we haven't really we've talked a lot about Colombia. Um, this is affecting Guyana because uh, the the sedimentation, the mercury that's flowing through the Cuyuni River into Guyana is horrific. Um, SOS Orinoco is about to publish a new uh, report on the Cuyuni, which is in the heart of the Arco Minero, and the impact on Guyana is, is really um, very disturbing. And then obviously what we're seeing in Brazil with you know, the flow of indigenous people uh, across the various borders in, in, in Roraima and the Alto Orinoco. So I think, um, you know, just to, to reiterate the point that you know, a, a, the speed at which this tragedy is evolving is um, not only going to define the possibility of a future transition and governability of Venezuela itself and, and the nature of Venezuela as a nation state for, for decades to come, but it's also going to impact the stability of the region. And, and the Caribbean, um, we're not, we're starting to see elements of it, but the, the, the amount of mercury that's flowing into the Orinoco River could eventually impact the Caribbean in its fishing and its mercury and, 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 and its tourism because of the levels of mercury. Thank you. Ale, any, any final words? Yes. So uh, we could see from all the presentation of all of us that illegal mining uh, is very much a transnational phenomenon at this point. It's not something connected just with Venezuela. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, and we all agree, like this problem will go uh, beyond the democratization of Venezuela. But as Kerry said, the, uh, the end of the Maduro regime is a condition sine qua non to start to solve this issue. So I think that uh, I would, uh, uh, I would call. Uh, uh, I would do a call for uh, really be focused on democracy and on human rights. These are both for domestic actors, but especially the international actors. It's true that these neighboring country and Colombia, that is a very important actor, can do uh, can do a lot. But at the same time, I think it's a responsibility of the historical democracy and very stable and consolidated democracy to focus on this and uh, have talks uh, how uh, Minister Trujillo was, uh, uh, was uh, proposing that they, they, Colombia can now left alone and uh, they need to have some serious and honest talks uh, how these uh, 
OECD guidelines or in general, like what the agreement to track the gold and also uh, have a strategy. I think that uh, what I uh, want to emphasize again, put human rights uh, as uh, if not at the center, at, at least uh, an important role in these talks. Thank you again to our speaker for sharing with us today and to our audience for joining. Certainly, we will continue this discussion on this very important issue. In the meantime, I encourage, I encourage our audience to visit CSAS.org and the Future of Venezuela Initiative website to stay up to date on the Venezuelan crisis and the role of the international community to help. I'm Moises Rendon, the director of the Future of Venezuela Initiative, and I hope to see everybody in our next virtual event. Net, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Moises. Thank you, CSIS. Thank you.